please allow this very brief introduction to our very distinguished guests tonight. Um, they probably need no introduction, but nonetheless, protocol is such. Um, Bill Hunt, over on the right-hand side, is a collector, a curator, and a consultant. And as far as I'm concerned, a beloved and lively presence in the international photography community. Hunt's Three Ring Circus, American Groups Before 1950. You just want me to say, it bears repeating. Bill Hunt is a lively and beloved member in the international photography community. Okay. You will be quizzed afterwards. Uh, Hunt's Three Wing Circus, American Groups Before 1950, is currently being presented in conjunction with the International Center of Photography at 1285 Avenue of the Americas through January 8, 2016. A book of his collection, The Unseen Eye, Photographs from the Unconscious, was published by Aperture in 2011. He has been a long time and lively and beloved adjunct professor at the School of Visual Arts BFA Photography and Video Department. Dale Kaplan is Vice President and Director of Photographs at Swan Auction Galleries. Her own collection of three-dimensional decorative and functional objects embellished with photographs has been exhibited at the Museum of Art and Design, the Morgan Museum and Library, and the Art Gallery of Ontario. Last but certainly not least, uh, Josh Sapin. Josh, is that the correct way to pronounce your name? Yeah. Oh, okay is the president and CEO of AMC Networks that operate the cable channels AMC, BBC America, and the Sundance TV, among many others. Josh serves on the board of the trustees of the People for the American Way and the Museum of the Moving Image. A book of his pho photography collection, The Big Picture, America in Panorama, with an introduction by Luc Sant, was published by the Princeton Architectural Press in 2013. Please give them a very warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're absolutely delighted <laughs> to be participating in a panel at a time that Bill's remarkable exhibition, Hunt's Three Ring Circus, American Groups Before 1950, is on display. And um, one of the questions that I had, because we're going to talk for a little bit and then each show slides from our very singular collections is, why American groups? Do you differentiate between pictures taken here, pictures taken elsewhere? Because last summer, Bill and I were lucky enough to have shows of our collections at the Arles Photo Festival in the south of France. And what I learned there is that there is a very active vernacular photography movement, collecting impulse, curatorial books. So talk a little bit about the American aspect. I think the American thing is a way of limiting it, just to initially arbitrary. It's like the 1950. The first time I did this show was 1960, and then I went, no, 1950 sounds better. And people go like, hey, you know, this one was made in 1963. And they go like, oh, but, um, <laughs> American was a way of limiting it. And also, the European ones are different. And there is something about these pictures that seems idiosyncratic and uniquely American, that there is a way of behaving uh, in these photographs that is unique to America. I will show you a picture later of people in Italy looking at these pictures like they never saw anything like it before, <laughs> which I think is really, People would come in, uh, somewhat in France too, they would just gape at them that they'd never seen anything quite like it. Which isn't true because it does exist there, but not as, as richly. I think it's a rich part of our social history. Absolutely. How about you, Josh? Your pictures, what criteria did you use in compiling images for the book, looking at the material, is there a very distinctive American component, or? Well, I should confess that uh, some of my photographs are, in fact, Bill Hunt's photographs. So, uh, you heard it here. You heard it here. That's the major revelation. So, you know, I'm I'm not so sure there was anything really 
uh, d uh, absolute. In my determination, it really was more about perhaps feeling. If I diagnosed the feeling, it was that there is something at least, it feels like at least if I attempt it in my book to portray the building of a country. It was a newish country if you go back to uh, the 19th century, the late 19th century. So it was a new country and, and the country was being developed, the transcontinental railroad was being built, and at least it feels to me like that energy is in these groups and you sort of feel the development of a country, the development of land that hadn't been settled and the determination of you know, religious freedom a little bit and what religious freedom meant and uh, at, so I think it, there is something, I can't say it definitively, but it feels quintessentially American about frontier and openness and determination of religion and principle and all that stuff. But I will tell you that it wasn't in my mind when I did it. It occurred to me more along the way and after the fact. So there is a, there yeah, is a collection ahead. though, isn't there? You do own a lot of these pictures. No, I do, I do. I just wanted to give credit to Bill, which is I do own a lot of these pictures that I've been collecting for 35 years, but when I came upon Bill, I just got the benefit of uh, some additional photographs and his help and wisdom. So um, <clears throat> each of us are collectors with very idiosyncratic tastes. Um, as you'll see, a lot of the imagery that embellishes the three-dimensional objects in my collection are single individuals. You should define, describe your collection. Um, my collection is a compilation of three-dimensional decorative and functional photo objects, uh, 19th, 20th, 21st century, that draw from many different types of impulses. Some of it is folk art, some of it is artisanal, some of it is um, uh, influenced by contemporary practices. And the question that I had in listening to the two of you talk about your collections, does photography serve as the armature and the frame? Um, because I know, Josh, when we were talking, you spoke a lot about social significance and interdisciplinary kinds of currents and influences, which for my collection is really important. And so I, I wanted to talk about that from the vantage point of vernacular photography is one context because that's sort of the rubric that's used to contextualize what, what each of us are doing. And, and so um, how do you look at your collection? Is it largely photographic? Is it folk art? Is it? You, you know, it's a good, it's, I, I, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think I look at it. Do you guys, anyone collect vernacular stuff? Keep it around? Oh, good God, there's a whole room of interested people. I thought I would actually be just boring the shit out of everybody, but <laughs> maybe not so. So other people That's would say. It's not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's chance to, there's still an opportunity to sleep and go to your digital devices. So. <laughs> I actually wonder about it. You know, I actually would answer that question by saying, you guys, I would love to hear what you have to say. I look at it, um, it, it all feels a little like relics, and it all feels a little like anthropology, you know, stuff that's revealing, and, uh, and it feels a little like archaeology. Uh, I'll confess, not for the record, that my ex-wife was an archaeologist, so I watched her dig up random stuff from digs that was supposed to be revealing about what peop where people were. And so I guess the vernacular photography and these groups that I've collected for a long time, I think are, it is photography and it does feel like a little bit of um, uh, anthropology and archeology span because it feels like stuff and symbols that are representative, yeah. Oh, so do you mind defining vernacular? Because you'll do it better than I will. Would you mind? I'll give a wrong definition, and then I'll feel like a complete jerk associated with an educational institution. I think vernacular photography is a term that's in transition. In other words, it's not definitive, because when we speak about it, the first thing I always say, it's, it's borrowed 
from architectural disciplines. And so from the vantage point of visual culture, vernacular photography is the anonymous picture, the picture by lesser known commercial, industrial, amateur photographers, the work that falls outside the scope of the classical photography canon, and therefore, um, as collectors, rather than relying on the name, the status, the reputation of an artist or photographer, we're looking at images, we're looking at the quality of objects, um, sort of taking skills associated with connoisseurship and overlaying them on this vast, vast array of images. I think part of it has to do with recontextualizing it too, where you take something that isn't art and you go like, no, I really think this is worthy and you, I'll put it here and ask you to look at it and say, don't you have a similar reaction? And that that's why the whole vernacular thing ends up with a, a, a different, an untested credibility that it, I think it's earning its way. It's weird though for collectors when they, I think, sort out what they're actually collecting when they, when they realize, when they recognize what their taste is and what they're drawn to. And I can remember going to his house once and he was making fun of my first collection and and I said, so what's the deal with you? You've, all these pictures have this deep, vanishing perspective. And it was as if he'd never looked at the collection before. But there was this consistent compositional element. So how long does it take before the uh, MO of your collecting impulse really begins to make itself apparent? You were talking about that a little, Josh. Was there a particular time, experience, number? <clears throat> you know, I, um, by the way, Luc Sant has written, you know, he's a few, he has a few of these vernacular photo books. If you haven't seen them, one is called uh, Folk Postcards, and the other is he, he did Crime Scenes. And he wrote, writes beautifully on the subject, and he wrote about the accidental nature of his collecting beginning, which is actually, if you like the subject, I thought he and Bill were the only two people I've ever read who wrote so insightfully about it. So yeah, it, it, it just, it's a little bit as Bill said, it seems to take shape over time and you have to look back and step back and then say, what do I have here and what does it all say and uh, how did I get there? So, but I can go on and on about it if you want uh, at greater length. How about you? What's your answer? Well, I, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to participate in this talk is the presentation of the collector in the media today is as the ultimate consumer, you know, the sort of uber shopper. And I think that collecting is very much this kind of adventure into the unknown and um, when I started um, acquiring objects, you know, there was just this gut instinct or response that said yes without knowing why. And for me, that was a very disconcerting feeling. Without knowing why. Yes, yeah. without but, knowing why. But that's the best. That's when you never make a mistake. When your gut just oh. screams, this one, this one, you never make a mistake. It's when you... It's when you like know stuff that you start going, oh, I should get this because better when you've got the thump, thump, thump. It, it's so interesting, this, uh, this context creates all yeah. notion because I work in the TV business and have for years and in the earlier days, this goes back 30 years or 40 years, uh, we were showing old movies, and they and old movies were on television, and they were referred to as reruns, mm -hmm. or old movies on WPIX. You're right, American Movie Classics. We've since gone on from there, and so the the the, the fundamental concept of this channel initially was they're not just old movies to play that are cheap; they're actually classic movies, mm -hmm. 
And similarly, and even, I think it's even stronger illustration, there was a channel you probably remember called Nick at Night, and they showed old, old TV shows, and with appropriate self-deprecation, a person who worked there said, our tagline is, our reruns are better than their reruns. <laughs> <laughs> but what they, he really meant was that when you look at whatever the show was, as illustrious as All in the Family or as silly as Dick Van Dyke, it's not just an old, dumb TV show. There's something in it to be looked at with care. And when Bill said it's all about how you curate and the distance or theme sometimes creates clarity, it's just so true. And it's so much fun when it happens. I think Josh's point to bring up American movie classics is a really interesting one because in some ways the field of classical photography, 20th century photography that many of us grew up with, some of us actually studied in the university, is really being challenged and in a good way. I think that those sorts of uh, frameworks and boundaries are falling away and photography is moving more into the realm of visual culture and this kind of examination from many different disciplines. Um, was it Sam Wagstaff who said that photography is the Esperanto of the 20th century, looking at how he collected vernacular photography and as you said, Dorothy, didn't really make a distinction between a so-called masterwork and a great anonymous picture. In my own evolution as a collector, I used to have, a, in, in my book, there's a snapshot. And for the longest time, the snapshot sat in the drawer because I didn't think it had any legitimacy because it wasn't by a named photographer. And slowly it made its way out and I got it mad and I would put it out and people would say, oh, what's this? And I would go, Gary Winogrand. <laughs> Nobody knew. <clears throat> but it was liberating because I thought it was a great picture and it gave me permission to go just look. He's and it, very He's very challenging. Oh, yeah. But I don't like Gary <laughs> <Winograd>. So, <laughs> But it was, for me as a collector, it set me free that I could look at stuff that, just look at it and react. So is it time to show some pictures? Let's show some pictures. How do we just <laughs> bang on. We got Josh up first. Okay. He's going to talk about these great pictures and where he bought them, how much they cost, and where they are today. There we go, the visual. Thank you, Maria. Lovely visual. There are names. Ah. Yeah, so that's the picture. That's the cover of the book. So I'll just flip through. I don't have that much to say. You know, just, it'll wash over you, OK? I mean, uh, yeah, bathing beauties, they're fairly common. You see them around. I just think that they were amazing pageants. They were do you have happening. A first, do you have a first one that you remember as the first oh. picture you bought? You know, uh, you know, I came upon it. It was really accidental. It was all just um, buying them in frames and thinking, like you said, that I'm going to just put them on the walls because I couldn't tell. I, you know, I, later, when I thought about it, I thought, Sociology, anthropology, photography, revelation. Initially, I just thought that's cool. You know, I really thought nothing of it. So I don't quite remember, but I do remember, if it's of any interest, being drawn increasingly to complete idiosyncrasy. So that you can find uh, baseball teams aplenty, banquets aplenty, picnics aplenty, and then you just get the really weird stuff, the Bund Society or a group in blackface who was doing something, or, and then they just became almost <clears throat> uh, whatever the word is when psychological becomes group psychological. It just felt odd for, you know, these sort of, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm actually not sure, but I've thought about that probably too much. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's an identity thing at the beginning of the 20th century of people becoming all these, going into all these clubs and fraternities 
And this was a way of, by making the photograph, it identified, it gave them some solidarity, some identity. And it was a real social phenomenon. So you get these clubs. And the clubs are much more interesting than the military pictures or the uh, banquet. Any, any group of odd fellows is fine with me. You know, but it may be, you know, th th there's this, uh, do you remember the band The Kinks? Yeah. So Ray Davies, uh, who was the major songwriter for The Kinks, who is, I think, a brilliant songwriter, and, and if you're interested, has this CD or record called Storytellers, in which he tells, through story and song, the evolution of The Kinks. But anyway, they have a, a one song called Picture Book, I'll quote Ray Davies, and he says, pictures of each other taken by each other to prove they love one another a long time ago. The line always occurs to me, because I always think that everybody right. is celebrating the thing of them. Do you know what I mean? And we actually do it today. I work in a company, and we go away, and then we say, time for a group photograph. And I don't think anybody's particularly motivated, but it's sort of, it, it, it feels a little bit like now it's the time to show solidarity and pride. It may not exist, but it's some statement of purpose and collective purpose that you do, uh, you just do. I always love the ones of sad people because they're, all, they're never sad. They're always so happy to be in the damn picture. <laughs> yeah. I think it's also something about the changing nature of the country, you know, with urban and urbanization. Suddenly there are lots of people in the cities and how do you kind of create this sense of a collective identity? You know, the other thing that would happen is the introduction of the circuit camera and how that makes it possible to photograph large groups of people. In fact, you could be photographed twice if you were a clever man or woman with the circuit camera. As it swung from left to right, you could just scoot over to the other side of the frame and be in the picture twice. So that is one of the pageant bathing beauty things. They're actually a plenty. They're, you know, if you do, if you wander in junk stores and stuff, or you go on the Library of Congress website there's actually gazillions of these from all sorts of locations, and it was a thing. Uh, you know, I guess if there's anything maybe in today's world when one looks at these, they're of course all women, never men, bathing beauties. So there's that, but that probably never occurred to anybody back then. But they're in almost every geography. Yeah, that was in Seal Beach, California, which actually is a really nice little town. Still, I've been, yeah. You know, I'm actually not sure. They all seem to be, they all look like flappers, sort of, you know? So I think they're right around then. It was a thing. Uh, I think you find show business stuff earlier, like chorus girls, but I don't see, think you see bathing suit people. Yeah. Yeah, the Wild West which I know, I know little about this photograph. I probably should have the caption because a lot of the photos had captions written so somebody studied them. I had sort of people of note write captions in an effort to add interest to the book. But I, I actually, this is actually my picture. There but you go. I, actually think what, but I in, told you that. It's so, by the way, isn't it good I said it that I confessed early? But I, well, one of the things I really <laughs> like about this is that there isn't any information about it. Yeah. You know that there were these Wild West shows, but I don't know who this is, and I did some research to find out who it was, but I don't know who it was. And that's fine, I'm happy with that. There you go, unknown photographer, well, bless you. No date, too. Yeah. Let's <laughs> see what it says, now we'll know. Is this a Bill Hunt? Yeah, that's a Bill Hunt. See, it's a Bill Hunt. Go ahead, Bill, you wanna talk about it? Because you'll know. Go back to the picture. Sure. This is, this is actually one of my favorites. It's probably the longest picture in the collection, <clears throat> and I love that it's so full of life. All these people may be on the lunch hour. I don't know what the situation was. And they all know how to behave for the camera. They know how to be in the frame. And they know when the photographer's going to make the shot. This just 
bursts with life. And that's why I, I love this picture. And I love the chaos of it, too. You find two kinds of pictures in the, these group pictures. You find very orderly ones, and then you find some that are just madness. And this is one of the madness ones. That's yours. Yeah. So it's a, that's, whoops, sorry, it's just a baseball, baseball team, the old timers. So where oh, were you sorry. finding stuff? Oh, you know, I uh, um, was really, if you go to uh, really junk stores, mostly junk stores, you know, antique stores they would be called, but they yeah, were lower end. They're actually called junk stores. They're junk stores, yeah. <laughs> if you go to an antique store, it's too expensive. Right. Better in the junk store. Right, so I was really rarely paying above 50 bucks or 40 bucks. And that's framed. That's framed. Of course it's framed. And then I hung them. But they go back. I mean, I did this for a really ridiculously long time. Uh, you know, it was, goes back for me. <clears throat> actually, it goes back 40 years that I've been just amassing them. And uh, yeah. Let, let me interrupt and ask you the question about you as a collector, because I know two other things you collect. Yeah. Would you describe I'd them for people? And yeah. So can I ask? I'm gonna just gonna I'm gonna answer that in one second. Can I ask the collected group one other question? Are there? Raise your hand if you would. If you collect more than one thing. Right. So Bill asked me, and I I have collected several different things with some vigor, <laughs> although they began innocently enough, as they say. And so I uh, collected these photographs for many years and <clears throat> collected, started to collect old lightning rods, which were beautiful. They're really, um, you know, they're decorative because the old ones have weather vanes in them. So they really do look different. So they're he lives in a tower on Central Park West. Don't go on a rainy day. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, and so now a few of them are in the Franklin Institute in, uh, in Philadelphia because I asked them if they wanted to display a few because I think I have the largest collection in America, which isn't saying much, of old lightning rods. But, and then I, this is a really odd one. Um, I began to collect like you. I would go to and bu buy, not outsider art, but I would buy art in sort of junk stores that was discarded, sort of yard sale art, and appreciate it just for its randomness or primitive nature. But then I sort of upped the ante on that, and this is what always gets me going. And I always think that I'm seeing something in it that others are not, or it needs to be emancipated, do you know what I mean? And elevated. I'm not kidding, and so I think if I can emancipate it and elevate it, then it's going to get the true recognition it deserves in the world, and I'm going to be the hero <laughs> of it. And so I get really almost lost in that and almost forget my affection for the stuff on this mission. And that happened with the lightning rods. You know, I just got to get them all. And then I'm going to have a big show, and I'll do a coffee table book, and everyone will realize that this is industrial art that's been underrecognized, and I'll have the largest collection in America, and it'll be fantastic. And then it will be a footnote in history that these lightning rods were given their rightful place in life by me, which didn't happen. And then I'll just tell you the last one because it is curious. Lightning did not strike. Lightning did not really strike. Yeah. And then <clears throat> I got into this thing from the art of I thought, OK, there's all these paintings that are made by would-be artists, but there's sort of Picasso going, nah, throw it out. And so I'm gonna rescue all those. And so I went to art schools, and I spent a fair amount of time asking them if they would allow me in on what's now called, I understood the word, locker clean-out day, and go rescue the paintings that were being thrown out by the art students before they went to the garbage. And I started with, um, the Art Students League, and whew, locker clean-out day there is, it's in the thousands of, of canvases that they're getting rid of. So I went with a moving van, 
No, seriously, and it, it got really interesting because... I hope the other collectors find this really liberating, <laughs> that you go like, I'm really not into it that badly. Right, so I got really into it because I got into the thing of it. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to really get going on this. And so I got a storage facility, and then I wired up, and I went to Parsons, and I was in the thousands of them. You know, and then I set up, this was before websites proliferated, and I set up a website, and it was called Discarded Art. And then I thought I'd get a humongous building somewhere that had little traffic, and I would have the Museum of Discarded Art, and people would see unintentional and unrealized great art. But it didn't also have a destiny. It was insane, really. And so then uh, I ended up auctioning it. Um, for a charity, for AIDS care. And it's sold in Atlanta <laughs> sort of well, and then they set up an online auction, and I, they said, do you want to donate more? And I said, just take it. And so it sold all over the planet. And then I got fell in love with the ecosystem of I'm saving the art, I'm letting it be recognized. It's a perfect ecosystem because then it's being auctioned and the charity money is going to a virtuous cause. It is the ultimate form of social and artistic recycling. So that's that story. And then I've repressed the other inclinations I've had. I can share them with this group because I'm among friends and nothing's being written down. So I started to collect lightning, I mean, pardon me, uh, umbrellas. Because I thought that the textile and the fabrics of them, as well as the mechanics, but mostly the fabrics, would represent a phenomenal look at textile or whatever the hell it's called, design through time. And my poor wife, who's Episcopalian and very neat and doesn't like stuff at all, you know, she's had to endure it. And I remember her line about this. She said, it smells like my mother's closet. <laughs> and so I sort of, uh, with the counsel of a professional, I cut that one short. But I really did, I had a vision of a humongous wall, imagine it, with open, open umbrellas a thousand of them, through time, seeing the history of the design of umbrellas, which I thought would be amazing. And I still can't get it out of my head. Do you know what I mean? I, don't, I think we should make it happen, I think, really. I agree. I think there are some buildings that can be The utilized. bad luck collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, sort of. But I was trying not to... Did you rescue umbrellas from the street? I was, you know, I started to buy them on eBay, just the standard stuff, and I started to buy them in junk stores. And the, the, then I, on eBay, you can find anything, so I found the more odd and interesting, the better, and then there were some great handles on them. And, uh... Is that right? Yeah. The, the open yeah. He's booking a ticket as we speak. But the thing I was going to say, the reason I asked the question is I read somewhere once that there was, I don't know if this is right or not, there was a genetic predisposition for collecting. I think it's later than that, but I've got my own theory. Let's yeah. bang on. So yeah, bang on. Let's see, oh, sorry, let's yeah. see Dale's. Picking up all this time. Dale, go ahead. There she is on TV. Dale is on TV. <laughs> Josh is TV. And I watch it. <laughs> So, Dale, what, what are you doing now? I should ask. What are you, you... Okay, this is a segment of Antiques Roadshow. A collector came into the roadshow in Florida with a collection of outsider photographs. So the performers associated with uh, P.T. Barnum's circus. And... Um, but why is he an outsider? Because he's obviously a studio guy doing uh, cabinet Well, cards. some of them were were by Eisenman, the Bowery photographer, who was considered an outsider, though he was a commercial photographer, because as we know, photography was just an illegitimate art form, very peripheral to any kind of artistic expression. And that's why the woman is listening to me so raptly, because um, she was shocked at the value of this collection, which actually Swan ultimately sold for about $20,000. Here we have yes. the famous 
Ansel Adams coffee can. For those of you who have um, an awareness of some of the photo objects that have come to market, this has brought a smile to many people's faces. Uh, Swan has actually sold the coffee can without the coffee. There are three pound and five pound versions. <laughs> and, um, it's and it's Hills Brothers with a photograph by Ansel that is actually very difficult to find because one of my clients bought the coffee can and then called me to say, but I'd really like a copy of the vintage print, which is um, winter morning sunrise. And I called a couple of our colleagues and they said, doesn't exist. And so this idea of a disposable item suddenly having a featured image that's very uncommon and difficult to find. There's some great irony there. But the can's rare too. How many cans are there? I'm not sure the can is as rare as we once thought because as they've started to appear at market, more of them have been on eBay. And our intern at Swan actually found the quintessential coffee can these were um, apparently made available with what we call a belly band, a little very graphic wraparound piece of paper that advertised a camera that you could buy for $2.50. And so whereas we thought these cans were fairly unusual and uncommon, um, Oliver Lott, our intern, actually found the prototype of the coffee can. Oh yes, and here we are in my studio. Some of you actually have kitchens that function as kitchens. This is a picture of my kitchen. And in the upper left corner, you see two Ansel Adams coffee cans. My very first object was gifted to me by Bill Hunt, who found one in a flea market? In South Carolina, in a junk store. A thank junk you very store. much. Thank you very much. That was, I went to the counter and I said, uh, well, how much for this sheet of music? And the can. <laughs> and the, Good he wanted, strategy. He wanted 10 bucks for the can, and I went, no, seven. <laughs> so, and then I, I knew Dale wanted one because I'd seen a slide presentation, and she announced that this was the holy grail My of holy pop, grail. pop yes. photographica. But she didn't have one, and so I was very pleased to give her a $7 hey, Dale, do, coffee uh, can. How many are there of these things, do you know? Of the coffee cans? I think um, <clears throat> one of my colleagues did a quasi-census, and he came up with 1,000 copies. Many of them are in institutional Dale, collections. Sure. The can was manufactured in 1969, so that's a period in which Marge Nykrug opened her gallery in New York. Lee Witkin's gallery was operational. But other than that, I guess the Grape Steak Gallery in the Bay Area and Tom Halstead, you know, we're looking at a, a climate in which photography was still pretty disparaged and under the radar. Mm -mm, not to my knowledge, no. But um, this past summer at the Arl Photo Festival, the director of the festival, who's a former curator, <coughs> pardon me, someone named Sam Storzy, um, who's you know quite a brilliant guy, he organized a show of record albums. So vinyl, LP albums in which photographers of the ilk of Avedon, Penn, Dwayne Michaels, Ansel Adams, all had featured photographs. So this idea of looking at photography as from a social perspective, I think is part of what Josh is doing, Bill is doing, certainly what I'm doing. Yes, on the album cover. Is that correct, Bill? Yeah. And then the um, below the Ansel Adam coffee cans are um, decorative plates with Rauschenberg images. Uh, on the far side 
are just miscellaneous objects, tins, presidential plates, Elvis, mugs. Did you buy contemporary stuff? Yeah, in fact. Some in Pope the, photographica? In the 20 years that I've been collecting, so I'm very fresh and young by many standards, I started out by sort of tracing this um, alternative history. Oh, there are photographs on tin. Oh, there are photographs on glass and leather and wood. And it was just endlessly fascinating to nerdy old me. And then I realized, wait a minute. All these contemporary artists are using photography and making multiples, but don't want to identify themselves as photographers. Maybe it would be more interesting to start now and go back instead of trying to start from the beginning. So that's more of what I've started to do, looking at um, everyone from Vic Muniz to Damien Hirst to Jeff Koons, all of whom are making these really interesting photographic objects. So this is a view of my living room, which, as you can see, has a lot of stuff. And my collection just takes over my living space. I just sort of hang out there because I have 2,500 objects. Not all of them are in my studio, which is about 1,000 square feet. I do have a storage facility as well. And um, ideally, I would like to find a residence, a home, in which I can install my entire collection. I, I love the idea of it being a familiar environment, not a white cube, in which all types of individuals can come and walk in the door, and it's a non-intimidating sort of space. Uh, one of the first objects that I collected is this little cyanotype pillow. Uh, I don't know if you can actually read the images, but it's a <coughs> child's pillow, so they're very soft, poetic. The pillow is tiny, and um, cyanotypes, of course, were very popular at the turn of the last century and used in albums, um, the sort of quintessential popular type of photography. So this is a very interesting item that I bought on eBay, of all places. And believe it or not, there is a woman in the Midwest, her name is Elaine Huntsman, who's a folk artist and is finding tintypes and, I guess, vintage textiles and recycling them, creating these um, three-dimensional collages that are very Duchampian, are very inspired, uh, despite the plebeian nature of the object. And I think a lot of young artists are sort of following in her footsteps, looking at the material that exists, the, the hundreds of thousands of tintypes and daguerreotypes and paper images, and reconstituting them in in all kinds of ways. And it's really, really interesting to me that this material has a kind of new artistic life. <laughs> uh, good question. I don't remember how I found it because um, Pop Photographico, which is the name that I coined for this material, isn't exactly popular currents. Uh, so a currency, so I usually try folk art, outsider art, and see where that will lead me. Um, another wonderful artifact from the 60s. Um, when we were kids growing up, we all made these lanyards, and how this kind of craft, popular form found new iterations. So this is a obviously three-dimensional box, and the images on the back of the images are all these family notations. So, you know, again, to Josh and Bill's points, all this stuff becomes disassociated from families and shows up in junk stores or on eBay. And I mean, it just kind of blows my mind that this wouldn't be uh, maintained as some family treasure because it's so dear and so unique and so special. And, and so this is a piece I'm the of prison art, yes? Prison? Well, this <laughs> became a kind of prison art, so that's another iteration, but I think this is more the lanyard phase 
when candy wrappers and cigarette wrappers and the plastic doodads were created and just a kind of fun art form that then found new currency in the prison system. Um, interesting to see how uh, material culture, these artifacts are, you know, so kind of visionary. Um, there it is, Southwestern Bell and this family telephone with pictures that are from 1971. Uh, Bill <coughs> grabbed this picture off of my website, uh, popphotographica.com, and as you can see, um, Sarah did a very nice job of organizing it, so there are different um, categories and ways of sort of cross-referencing material. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we had this ready in conjunction with the show at Arl last summer. And I published this book, which on the screen is quite large but in real life is actually a kind of photo poche. It's pocket size. And again, I look at this material as very accessible and populist and kind of like this drawing from artistic and vernacular impulses and this new way of looking at photography. I'm anticipating that probably a 7.15 drop dead date on this, so I'll do is with some dispatch. So there's the show up right now, the group show, and um, it's 51st and 6th Avenue in the UBS building. And this is a little book I did last summer when I had the show. I, I've shown the collection a couple different places. This was in France, and I made a little book that I was very happy with. But... Uh, the, I have another collection, which is bigger and better known, of magical, heart-stopping pictures of people in which you can't see their eyes. And within that, there were all these, there were some group pictures, which I thought were just bewildering, that why in this picture of lubrication, all these <laughs> girls with Kleenex on their faces, you go, what are they doing? I love group pictures of people holding things for no good reason. I, I have this picture of people eating watermelon, that's one of my favorites, that... Um, so that's the location. This is a good chorus line picture. And once upon a time, I did a funny little book for Christmas. This is old, 1892. Amazing to find a group of people all with their eyes closed. I thought that was good. <laughs> They're at a funeral, so it makes some sense. Um, and so that's the. So I was. I had some groups, and then I. Um, there's a Sam Wagstaff thing about. The first picture he ever bought was a group photograph. And people asked, why did you buy this picture out of the flea market? And it was because his dad was in it. I love this picture, and my parents are in it. This is the St. Clair River Dance Club in 1955. And I just think it's so swell and so American, and, and I love the whore on the piano. <laughs> There's this one woman who's been segregated from the other ladies. But I love them in their cocktail dresses and dressed up. And... Um, so that's my Wagstaff homage. This is not going. Uh, this is a, a notorious photograph that's not at the UBS because we thought it was too provocative. It, and I didn't get it. Josh didn't get to use this one in the book because I was saving it for myself. My favorite thing about this is that there are people in the picture who do not have hoods on but have dinner napkins over their faces, <laughs> which I... The whole idea of why are you making a photograph of a group of people and then you have a napkin on your head. <laughs> Although there's another part that I actually, this picture has been published a couple times. It's the only picture that ever made money for me, which I thought was, which was good. Uh, so there were a couple iterations of this collection. The HCP Houston Center for Photography uh, they wanted to show the other collection, and I was going, oh, no, 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 it's, that's a big deal. You don't, you don't get that one. <laughs> Such a boob. And I went, hey, let me call you back in 10 minutes. So I literally looked under the bed, because I thought, you know, I got all these group pictures. Maybe I got a show there. There were 100 pictures under the bed. And so I dusted them off, and I said, oh, I think we've got another show. We did this show in... Houston called, what was it called? Regroups, regarding groups. 
This was my favorite iter installation, iteration of the show. This little tiny room with 150 pho photographs. The conceit was that you take an acid, passed out in a VFW hall, which blew up in the middle of the night, and you awoke surrounded by these photographs which had nothing to do with, with each other. But it had a digital picture frame, and it had the Busby Berkeley video in it, which is wonderfully insane. And it's floor to ceiling. And I, I don't maintain that you have to look at all the pictures. Just come in and look at a couple. That's <laughs> fine with me. So uh, I was very, very happy with this. And I love the red. That's the Bill red. We've used the red a couple times. So then, uh, then it happened in Bologna. Uh, Photo Industria, a new biennial, now in its second manifestation this year. <laughs> Nobody came to Bologna. However, they gave me this great old church that they wallboarded with these things. And the thing that was so <laughs> phenomenal for me was that people just came in and they couldn't, they, they oh, mamma mia, look at that. It was, it was so funny. They would go running up and in total disbelief that these photographs existed. And I, of course, am looking at these Renaissance paintings that I've defiled by putting up my, my silly little group pictures. And, um, and then I had the show in Arles, which was really fun and happy. And I borrowed this picture from Josh, because this is a Key West train leaving from Key West, which I think is really, really interesting, because how did the train get there? If, because they seem to label this as the first train trip. Did they make it in Key West? So actually, no, I, I think the history is Flagler built it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Flagler built the railroad all the way down to Flor South Florida. Then he built it over to Key West, then it all blew up in a hurricane, right? Hurricane yeah. 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 But my point is, did the train start in Key West? Did they build it there? The, the conks all put it together? No, it came from is it? Yeah, from but yeah. anyway, this is a really cool picture. And I'd always, I would always get this comment about, oh, you must just love looking at all the little faces in these pictures. And I go, well, you know, I don't really see that well. <laughs> so I like the jazz of the picture. I like the shape, but I can't see their faces. So I hoard out on this, then I blew it up to like 12 feet long on a piece of canvas so that people could see the little faces. Here's the detail from Josh's book. So you can knock yourself out, look at the damn little faces. Um, this is a picture that uh, has been in all these shows that I adore by someone whose name has various, variously been attributed to Tuffer, Tupper, whatever. You know, I've got the loop out trying to make out this guy's name. But I love how this picture behaves because there's no depth of field at all. It has this magenta cast. Uh, they look like they're all hanging from something. Uh, and that happens in these pictures, that they take this whole, take on this whole, um, behavior. Also, there is a thing about looking at these pictures that is different from other pictures. Most pictures you look at and you just go like, ah, I got it. I see it. These pictures, you get eye strain looking at them because you're like going like, oh, I can't believe them. Looking at this whole damn picture, looking at all their little faces. Uh, what's this? Um, oh, that's this is good graphics. I'll tell you, Linda Florio did the graphics for the New York show. And, and that's a guard who really is fascinated by the whole proceeding. <laughs> uh, and someone at opening night, Ricky Wright, brought me this Margaret Bourke White print as a gift. Of course, it's a modern print that her husband did. But nonetheless, now I've got it. And I've, I did this thing on Facebook in January. I started posting all these group pictures. And I knew something would happen, which is that <clears throat> if I died, there was going to be this unfortunate moment at the reading of the will when they recognized the fact that I didn't own all these pictures on Facebook, that I was pulling them all from uh, the Library of Congress and everything. But it was very fun. And I did have a beauty pageant with men. So that was, I was very happy with that. And, uh, and this is a picture I don't own. So if you have a spare copy of this, <laughs> I would be happy, happy to get it as a gift. There is a Coney Island picture in the show Uptown that predates this, which I think is pretty good. It's not as good, though. This is, a, this is, a, this is the best one. This, I, could, I, could, I don't want to die happy. I, want, I don't want to, I want to be happy. I'd live happy with this one. That's, it, that's what I mean to say. So that's what I've got visually. Thanks.
I think Ouija was a spectacle. Ouija would show up and everybody would go like, oh my god, what's that guy doing? Oh, he's going to make a photograph. Oh. Uh, and I think there are probably variants on it. And he probably screamed at everybody to look at the camera and say cheese. It is. What a good question. It is, however, only open on weekdays, Monday to Friday, whatever till whatever. In the lobby, right? In the lobby. It's big space. Though. And keep going, because there's six pictures down the hallway in the showcases that are worth a trip. There's a question. Oh, 1285 Avenue of the Americas. Hunt Three Ring Circus, American groups before 1950. We have a Ouija expert in the back of the hall, and he's here to tell us that it was the lifeguard stand. Yes. <laughs> There's a weird thing about collecting that is probably less operable with Dale, but I do think it's true of Josh and myself. Once upon a time, I had a 14-year-old kid ask me why I had to buy these photographs. And I remember, oh my god, what a question. And my answer was, because then they're mine. <laughs> so there's this whole covetousness to it. And I don't need to keep them. I'm happy to give them another life. But there's something about just having them and playing this mental like slideshow in my head of the pictures and knowing where they are. And they don't, I don't, I literally don't have anything out in my house right now. Zero. And it's, it's okay, because I know where they are. And if you want to see one, call me up and I'll show it to you and take a picture of it. Dale, of course, is just mired in. I photo think, objects. I, I think your question is a legitimate one, and that <laughs> part of what interests me about the material culture of photography is that sometimes there are ways of gathering information, but it's not necessarily about identifying the subject or identifying the photographer. And because photography is ubiquitous, and there are so many images, starting in the 19th century with daguerreotypes. Many daguerrean practitioners never uh, credited themselves as the maker of those images. So I guess what I'm saying is there's something inherently populist about photography, democratic, if you will, that works as a kind of collective identity. But when there are ways to discover more information, love it. So you're talking about auction, how we make selections for our auctions? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that there are certain components, criteria that relate to um, connoisseurship, if I can throw that term out, because the collectors of vernacular photography are pretty sophisticated people. Hello. And so, yeah, there are billions of pictures, but we don't pretend to know or anticipate what individuals collect. But there are kind of overriding themes that seem to emerge and that we hear about. And so we start there. And then if a great album or a single image comes our way and we've never seen anything like it before, well, we're going to give it a shot because it's, uh, it's a genre that lends itself to this kind of discovery in a big way. And, um, and that's the great part of what we do. You know, God bless Swan for risking stuff and getting off the canon every so often. And you do have a sale on Thursday, which I will flag for you. Thank you. Oh, wait, what, what's the sale on Thursday? What is it? We have a sale of photographs, um, fine art and vernacular photos, this Thursday the 15th. Our preview is um, open tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday morning. So please stop by if you've never been to Swan and take a look. So Bill will be giving a tour. I won't. Uh, <laughs> It came up earlier, so I'll pose the question, and I'll answer it first. 
about collecting and why people collect. And one of the reasons why I think I'm drawn to this, and perhaps Josh, is because the other stuff got expensive and it's, it's, it's a singular activity looking for this stuff. And I've, I always think that stuff I find I was meant to find, it was meant to be, that it's there for me to find. Uh, you said it was genetic. I don't think it's genetic. I think it has to do with um, nurturing, that it's a way of self-nurturing. At some point you were weaned prematurely or something, and this is a way of sandbagging yourself in life, giving yourself order where there's chaos, and that this is a pretty benign way of doing it. But that's my 50 cents about collecting and why people do it. What do you think? Me, I, I was actually thinking about it, and I was thinking about uh, sandbagging or nurturing, as you call it. I was thinking about if you're not, it's one stop before self-medicating. <laughs> <laughs> or this sounds like a smart-ass thing to say. It just occurred to me when you're talking. It's like an inanimate pet, but a lot of them. They make you feel good but they're not alive. I have two pets and I love them to death and they make me feel wonderful like all pet owners and I'm more in love with my dog. Than da, da, da. But they do sort of just make you feel good. The ownership and the proximity of stuff that means something to you. Just I did hang pictures good. at dog height <laughs> on 51st Street so that guide dogs could actually show the blind person the good ones. And what's your theory? Um, well... <clears throat> I think for me, this curatorial impulse just sort of takes over, whether it's a desire for kind of um, orderliness, taxonomies. But the thing that keeps me going is the humor of it. There's something just so uh, human, lighthearted, this creative impulse, and all the crazy iterations that it takes and feeling like it encourages a curiosity and engagement with life. And that's a good thing. A good place to end, yeah. maybe? Thank you all. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, SVA.